Uh, my own thoughts with it really go back to the fact that really virtually every classical tradition and so many people's deepest psychotropic experiences all go back to at the highest level, we realize that we are one fractal of a much larger structure and that everything goes back to the one. At all higher states of consciousness, all higher states of energy, one can experience unifying our consciousness and our unit and our own energy field with another being and about what that state is. When I trained at the Clair Vision School of uh, Australia with a French medical doctor who had worked with the, the Babaji lineage in, in India and with the Kriya Yoga lineage, he talked a lot about this concept of combinescence, that living beings can actually, outside of the physical body, consciousness and energy can combine together to look like one thing, and then it can separate again. The whole purpose of creation then being to be able to, at will, unify with others into combinescence, going back to the one, but also having the freedom to separate back to a separate fractal with free consciousness, free activity. That's the purpose of this whole crazy thing that we're caught up in the middle of at the moment. And so the, the essence of everything is the one. But then if you follow classical cosmology, like Chinese metaphysics, the one, the Wu-Ji, splits into the yin-yang. Now it becomes masculine, feminine, light and dark. Uh, the yin yang polarities and then it turns into more bifurcations until you get the ten thousand things of chinese metaphysics so i think you'll find expressions of this in only slightly different language in traditions all over the world and also in some cases supported by modern scientific research and physics concepts like what you're talking about like there's only one thing to begin with whether we call it the one electron or we call it the one consciousness or the one being, that's up to your to your perspective on things. But it's one thing <laughs> that then creates everything else in an incredible process to be able to experience itself and to be able to have a type of evolution that could not be done if you just stayed in an immobile center and never moved out of it. It's that breathing process from the center to the periphery, the center to the periphery, the one to the many, that creates this incredible, beautiful evolutionary process and all of the things that are the most delightful in human life as we learn to deal with all the things that are not delightful in human life. Amazing, amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm curious uh, in, in that context. I mean, it, so it sounds like you, yeah, you do agree with kind of the, um, or I'm curious to hear your thoughts on like, yeah, like that rendition of kind of the, the flower of life and like interpreting it as like the spirit taking one step and then looking back at itself. What are your thoughts on that kind of like metaphor so, or way of seeing? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the question. You know, it's absolutely fundamental to the work I do because I called my institute the Vesica Institute, which is the point where you move from the one to the two, but you still have the one in the overlap between the two and the Vesica in the middle. So I think the foundation of all this, you have to look at what is the original circle or sphere that is the one that starts everything out. And so you have to start with a zero-dimensional point. In modern three-dimensional and even hyper-dimensional theory, you've got the original point that's zero-dimensional, has no extended physical space. So in physics, it appears as the singularity that became, for all physical creation, was the singularity. Everything was in that one thing. Now, what that one thing does, if it expands out in an even way in all directions, you create the sphere. So the point in the center of the circle which you see in all the classical traditions, and I showed it on my Egyptian slide as the first image on an ancient Egyptian ruler. The first thing they showed you is the first act of creation in the ancient Egyptian ruler is a point in the center of the circle. The point is the singularity, it's our connection to the one state. And if it expands outward to create a container, a grail cup, to hold all creation inside of it, it creates a perfect sphere. The sphere is the perfect form because every point on the perimeter is equidistant from the center. And the center is the transcendental gateway beyond space and time, as Dr. Kareem says in Biogeometry. It is the divine plane. It is the state of oneness. Now, once you've got that, now you've got the first structure. You've got something manifest and created as the first circle or the sphere. Then, if you then, let's think of the egg in a mother's womb. It gets fertilized. What happens? It creates a vesica split. The one original cell splits into two. And that then becomes the basis of all further creation. So that's the first movement. Now we've moved from the one state to polarity. 
Now there's light and dark. Now there's masculine and feminine. Now there's yin and yang. And we have that because these are going to be attracted to each other or repelled to each other according to polarity, just like two bar magnets, where they're repel or they're attract. That gives movement. That gives evolution. That gives activity. And so at that point, we've got the vesica with two opposite polarities with freedom in the part of their structure that does not overlap the other and love and unity in the connection of the vesica where the two overlap perfectly, just like a perfect relationship between human beings. You've got half of you that's a free independent being and half of you that can then merge in beautiful oneness with your partner. And then at that point, as you then create more things, the one becomes the two, the two becomes the three, the three becomes the four, you're now manifesting more structures, which then manifest what people call today the, the flower of life. And then that becomes what people call today the seed of life, etc. Probably had different names in the ancient world, but that's how people know it today. And so that becomes a spherical matrix. So what you find in sacred geometry is a series of different matrices based on different shapes. And so the circle becoming the vesica, becoming the flower of life, and then expanding outward is a spherical matrix. Then there are other types of matrices based on triangles, squares, pentagons. These form the platonic solids, etc. Amazing, amazing. Uh, I think, yeah, well, while I have you here, and I know we're going to split into uh, questions as well, but uh, wh one thing that's definitely up uh, <laughs> of the of the top of my head is um, uh, I remember seeing in a video uh, you're trying to distinguish between uh, when you think that you're receiving some kind of communication or message from another entity versus when you're actually receiving, like there's kind of like it's important to discern between projection or like your own projections versus like actual communication. I wanted to bounce off this idea from, um, I mean, essentially a lot of people have reached out to me, like trying to explain what it is like to get like a message from an entity on DMT and like, why, why does it feel so genuine and authentic and like not a hallucination? And I think that it's kind of like a recurring experience that people mention is that when you enter in contact with a another civilization, another entity, there is a clear moment where it feels like you're tuning into a vibrational mode where they vibrate in a very specific way. And it feels like it's not your vibration. Like it feels like it's a, it's not even your own aesthetic, right? Like they may have like a different conception of beauty. <laughs> they might, <laughs> you know, like different patterns. And so it's like, what feels so alien and strange is like, wait, this is not beautiful according to me. Why why would my brain be generating this? I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on on this and like, yeah, the resonant frequencies of uh, other entities. <laughs> yes. So the initial concept is the one about there's a certain process of reversal on in what spiritual traditions call the astral plane. It's referred to as astral mirroring or astral reversal. You see it on some of the Egyptian temple walls being very clearly represented, this reversal process. So what happens in certain states is things that you are projecting outward will appear to you like they're coming to you from the outside, like an alcoholic in delirium tremens who is like going through withdrawal, and they're seeing these horrific figures coming toward them. But in some cases, those horrific figures are things they're projecting out of their own field that in this astral inversion, look like they're coming toward them. So every classical tradition that deals with consciousness development says this is what you have to be aware of in the beginning. You got to be aware of the reactive mind. You got to be aware of various types of projection. You have to be aware of what your monkey mind chatter is constantly generating and not taking your monkey mind chatter being reflected back to you as a real living external reality, because otherwise it completely consumes you and you're caught in reactivity. But it is possible to move past that through the clear mind state. So that's things like in the ancient world, things like Vipassana, transcendental meditation, you know, Zen. These are all things about just getting a clear mind state, that you're not generating a bunch of madness in the mind that's going to get reflected back. You're in a clear state. At that point, from the clear state, now that you're coherent, now you can tune into other consciousnesses, other wave patterns that exist in the world around you as authentically existing other consciousnesses that exist around us. So I believe that in psychotropic experience, many people do access very directly 
contact with non-physical realities, non-physical beings, something outside of them that often has a much more advanced consciousness than they do. Sometimes things of a less advanced consciousness where they appear as all kinds of weird things, basically what in the ancient world they would call elemental beings, now may appear as some type of weird dwarf robot talking to you or something like that. But this is then opening up to that very deep knowledge of classical traditions about all the types of beings that live in the spiritual world around us. And we're like fish living in water that don't know we're in water. We are beings living in a spiritual universe all around us, and we don't perceive any of it until we open those doors of perception, like Aldous Huxley talked about. So it's all then about being able to train the mind, clarify the mind. You find this in all the classical traditions. Then you can get clear mind state, stop projecting out your own crazy chatter, and you can then tune in to all the information and beingness that exists in the universe. Now, I'd like to ask you a question, too, because one thing that I found so fantastic and amazing in your work is the, I can't even imagine the amount of work that went into this, where you're able to identify the stages of the DMT activity as clear stages and how they correlate to specific types of things that are being perceived. That is incredibly valuable, because I believe you can't have a science of anything until you have a spectrum of the activity. And then you know where you are in the spectrum. You found that spectrum for DMT. I'd love to see you take that further to see to what degree that's applicable to other psychotropics so we can have a better mapping of what psychotropics are activating what types of functions in the development of human potential. There's some of that now, but I think it could be taken so much further. I think your work is a fantastic foundation for that. Really just so important. And also for myself, because I understand things uh, in a comparative sense. That's how I started out by looking at the sacred geometry taught by ancient traditions and how the exact same patterns were empirically rediscovered in modern physics, biology, and chemistry. And so here, when I talk about the classical idea of here's the physical plane, here's the plane of vital life force, here's the emotional astral plane, here's the mental, here's the causal, here's the spiritual, here's the divine, different names of different traditions, but that's what it's called in Western metaphysics today. I think there's a type of correlation there to the stages of the psychotropic experience and the thresholds of dosage that you talked about. At a particular level of dosage, you will hit a particular level. It may be possible to tune our experience to going up toward the vital force level or the emotional level where people have all their emotional purging or the mental level where their mind really opens up to the spiritual level where they're now perceiving in forms of beings because you've shown that movement through these stages and what you're communicating with and what you're seeing and then potentially the ultimate experience in all psychotropic experience, which is the oneness, that you are one with everything. So I do think there's a correlation between that classical model and what you found in empirical research with the levels of the DMT experience. So I just love to hear any of thoughts that you have about that. Yeah, no, thank you. I really appreciate uh, that, that you you really enjoy that research. I mean, like the, the whole kind of like set of insights started where like a very very great mathematician contacted me back in like 2016 i believe who had been exploring lsd in particular and essentially just like in sensor deprivation cataloging what are the symmetry groups that would appear in their visual field and this is just like starting with like two-dimensional structures and like that's where like oh my gosh like it seems like every one of the 17 possible symmetry groups can be instantiated as kind of like part of the psychedelic uh, symmetries. And, uh, and that was like, wow, like that means that actually whatever mechanism underlies, you know, resonance and consciousness is fully general. It's not constrained to some symmetries, but it can actually generate arbitrary symmetries. And, and for me, that was like, okay, like I haven't seen this reported anywhere. This seems like an important finding. <laughs> I started writing about it. The DMT uh, insights came later, kind of like building on top of that. And one of the very early kind of like indications, and a lot of people, you know, very, very good mathematicians, physicists have like mentioned these when they explore DMT, is they consistently find that the vibrations on DMT are higher frequency than LSD and also than most states of consciousness. And they're higher frequency in the sense of both temporal frequency, as in they vibrate very, they flicker very fast. And also they're high frequency in the sense that they're very detailed. I mean, actually on DMT, the detail that you see on the center of your vision, which is called the, the fovea of your visual field, 
can actually spread out to the rest of the visual field. Like you can have like a peripheral visual field that is as detailed as what you're seeing in front, like at the very center. And that that is a lot of information, right? Like there's a, you can <laughs> pack a lot of information in a visual field with that level of resolution. Uh, and, uh, and there is clearly a progression that is very mathematical. And I think like maybe one way of understanding it is kind of a, a combination of both of the Hui and Fresno principle that I was talking about, how like coherent waves are in some sense kind of the duo of having a lot of points simultaneously emitting a wave. That's kind of one component. But then the other component is the dimensionality of the experience that as on the early stages, you just have like these two dimensional symmetry groups, symmetry slabs, as I was talking about them. Mm -hmm. But in higher mm -hmm. dose, you essentially have like collections of them and each of them functions as a kind of witness, meaning that you have multiple frames of reference for every point. And so it is effectively, I'm pretty sure, like a higher dimensional state of consciousness. I don't know how or why that might enable communication with our other consciousnesses, but it, it would seem to me it would have something to do with um, generating a regular hyperdimensional space that maybe functions as an antenna. I mean, I, I don't know, but it's, uh, it does seem to be like that getting a certain dimensionality allows for like strange, you know, entity contact experiences. And if you don't get to that dimensionality, the entity contact experiences don't happen. So like, I think there's something to do with the dimensionality of consciousness, um, kind of like functions as a gateway or like as a necessary requirement. I think that's great. And I want to just follow up on that a, a little bit with the way that you're perceiving the, when you talk about higher frequency, lots of times in metaphysical circles, we say, oh, this is higher frequency than that. And we mean that in a more generic sense of like the awarenesses of a higher level, it's more clear, these types of things. I'm assuming that you're talking about higher frequency as a literal higher frequency being observed through brain mapping and that you're seeing literal higher frequencies coming in in areas of the brain that are being lit up during the DMT experience versus the frequencies that are lighting up in the, like, let's say, an LSD experience. Huh? Am I understanding you correctly? Uh, there's two kinds. So first, yes, higher frequency in terms of neuroimaging and the work that is most relevant here is published uh, by Selen Atasoy and Andrea Lupi, who've looked at LSD and DMT and the resonant modes, uh, what's called the connectum specific harmonic wave analysis. And that definitely shows that on DMT and LSD, you have uh, both a higher amplitude of the resonant modes, as well as like higher frequency, like the average frequency is higher. Um, but the, the main thing that I'm focusing on is the phenomenology that like essentially the patterns are very detailed, which suggests like a very um, superposition of like higher frequency harmonics as well as the flickering rate is higher frequency. So literally, you know, if you move your hand around on DMT, you will see a lot of copies of your hand kind of like hanging out in the air and they will be flickering at around like 30 Hertz, which is like really fast actually. Whereas something like LSD, it flickers at between 15 to 20 Hertz. So like, it's almost like DMT is like, not only a little bit faster, but it's like twice as fast. I, I remember seeing somebody on Twitter is pointing out that like DMT is like acid on acid or something like that. It's like LSD on LSD. <laughs> and it's, I think that's fairly accurate. It's like is the frequency of, of, of LSD. It's so very noticeable how much more detailed it is. That, that's wonderful. I think that would be incredibly useful as part of the mapping you did, like for DMT, to then show the relative mapping and frequencies. I don't know if you have that currently written up somewhere in your literature, but if not, mm. then putting together what's currently known about it and what yeah. you could be funded to do to examine further, to create a real mapping of the frequency states of the different types of psychotropics, because now that it's being accepted so much more for different types of mental and emotional healing, people could know which particular substance was the best for the type of healing needed in this particular session. I think that yeah. would be so helpful. I think that's where we're going to. I also saw that in one of your slides, you talked about working with, I think it was a 40 hertz frequency for a period yeah. of time and how that affected you in kind of a psychotropic way. Yeah. And could I ask how you chose 40 hertz? And is that related to the concept of of gamma waves, like versus delta or alpha beta, was it a gamma type of idea you're working with, or what was it? Yeah, yeah, I can briefly mention here. So first of all, 
the, the mapping that we do have for different substances is in, a, in an article that is called uh, Modeling Psychedelic Tracers um, with QRI. And essentially, yeah, that's where we quantify the flicker frequency of different substances. And there's like visualizations for all of the different substances. Uh, that said, we don't have as good of a map for like the the spatial component. Like this is, would be like this, the, the temporal frequencies. But the, the spatial ones, we don't really have one other than for DMT and 5-MeO DMT. Maybe they're like, you know, the most extremes. We took a look at those first. Um, but I mean, for a pattern that for sure is like very strange and difficult to explain is that entity contact really only happens on DMT. Uh, whereas like LSD, you know, you can be like higher energy, higher frequency relative to normal, but you don't have the, these like tuning into <laughs> what feels like other consciousnesses. Like that doesn't happen on, on L LSD for whatever reason. That suggests to me at the very least that there's kind of like a frequency threshold for like, okay, like maybe for interlock or contact with other consciousness you need like a threshold frequency and like lsd maybe just doesn't go as high uh, as that um and uh yeah i think like the the other thing is like yeah like um uh m no doubt like certain kinds of internal dissonances will be addressed by using different frequencies so the way in which we have like shown that is with our work on haptic vibration and for that you can find on youtube exploratory haptic research at qri uh, we have like a an hour-long presentation about all of our research there and one of the things that we did there was explore 40 hertz we explored that because that's been shown in the literature that like okay yeah it is connected to gamma gamma uh, frequencies gamma uh, oscillations and also it is being used to as an experimental treatment for Alzheimer's. So like we thought like, okay, this is probably an important frequency. Um, our, my overall impression was something like, if you are very dysregulated, 40 Hertz is actually very good, but it's kind of like a pacemaker. It's gonna like give something to help your nervous system organize around. But if you're already very healthy, if you already have like a lot of your resonances in harmony, actually 40 Hertz, might be kind of constraining it's kind of like collapsing the dimensionality of your experience and so I, I would advise like probably 40 hertz is great if you're very dysregulated but otherwise to don't do too much of it because then you're kind of like over constraining to that frequency and i think that's what at least in my case led to crazy sleep paralysis <laughs> involving 40 hertz okay wonderful thank you so much just a quick comment from me. I, I do know of people who have a strong background in uh, spiritual practices and meditative work who very much contact uh, non-physical beings and get information from non-physical beings doing LSD. So it may be a matter of the level of development that's been done cognitively by the person before they have the experience, whether the LSD is sufficient to get them to the contact state or not, because I know some people do have that experience. Uh, I also, also just want to mention one of my favorite stories from psychotropic uh, adventurers, which is uh, a guy goes to South America to do ayahuasca with a shaman. This is a true story. And the shaman gives him a bunch of ayahuasca. He gets way out there. He's wandering off into the jungle. And in the jungle, he meets these little illuminated beings, like very, very small beings. And they say, oh, we're here to tell you the big secret, that we're the beings that created the earth. We created the world. We created you. We created everything. The guy gets super excited. He goes running back to the shaman and says, hey, I met these beings who said they were the creators of the earth and they created you and me and they created everything. And the shaman acted completely unaffected by it. And he just kind of smiled and nodded. And he said, yeah, they tell everybody that. <laughs> so at this point, I think I better turn it back over to uh, Ali to get a, a few of the group's uh, questions in before we have to end here. A really interesting discussion. So the first question is actually from me to Robert. Um, okay. How would you explain the, the biogeometry idea of the energy of shape? Because people tend to understand the energy of sound, uh, as in, in the case of music, sound, music affects your state of mind. But the energy of shape, people really have an obstacle to understand. How would you explain the energy of shape? That's a great question. So there's a particular... <clears throat> 
formula that we use in biogeometry, which is energy into shape creates function. Now, to really understand what shape is, you have to take it from the way that we think of shape, because we think of shape as a dead, finished, inert thing. But the, we have to think of what is the forming process, the dynamic process that gives rise to a shape, and that's energy movement. So that's one of the most important things we talk about at the beginning of biogeometry. One of the secrets for understanding sacred geometry and classical traditions in a way it's not always understood today. And that is, if we think as energy as a particular manifestation level of consciousness, just like the chi, ki, prana, ether is understood as a separate level from these other consciousness state levels in many classical traditions, that that energy, if we think of the primordial energy, that primordial energy could become anything. It's like a stem cell. Stem cell can become anything in your body because <clears throat> it starts out as the one. The stem cell is the representation of the one. The one can become anything. And so for energy to take on a specific function, to take on a specific quality, to bring a specific divine power to bear, then that particular energy is put into an energy movement pattern. So to really understand shape, you have to see shape dynamically as an energy movement pattern. That's what stands behind the biosignatures. When we see the biosignatures from biogeometry, they look like little squiggly lines. But if you were to take it from 2D to 3D with these vortex and spiral types of movements, as it actually occurs in the human body, that energy movement pattern is programming the energy to perform a specific function of the heart, specific function of the liver, specific function of the pineal gland. It's all how that energy is put into a movement pattern. If you then look at that movement pattern and take a time-lapse photograph of the overall pattern, that's a shape. And so if we understand shape that way, as the dynamic process of tuning the energy for a specific function, that's what the shape really is. Um, is there any way to harness the, one, uh, the oneness energy? Could I transmit it into any environment or enter? Is it measurable? A question by uh, Mr. Bloom. Okay, is that one for, for me again? I think it's open to, to both of you, but I think it's, it's mostly uh, for you, Doctor. Uh, uh, okay, let me have Andreas go first. If you have something on that for more physical measurement, Andreas. Mm -hmm. I'll, I mean, I'll mention that, uh, interestingly, I think like oneness energy um, in, in the QRI model of psychedelic thermodynamics would actually be like in what way the f entire field of your consciousness can resonate with itself. And so actually like, you know, the shape of oneness energy is going to be specific to every particular individual because it's whatever reflects itself. Um, and so in that view, you may not be able to kind of spread just pure oneness energy to others because like you'll, you, you need to know actually what their shape is like. But the one thing you can spread that as a side effect would generate oneness energy is increasing impedance matching essentially increasing the capacity for synchronization. Um, and the sort of states that come to mind are MDMA and uh, 5-MeO DMT and loving kindness meditation that essentially is not so much a particular shape, it's more the process of harmonization itself, right? It's kind of like climbing the gradient <laughs> more and more uh, so that says like oneness energy is going to be specific to each individual or you might you can bias towards a harmonization process and that might feel like spreading oneness energy I, I don't know a little bit roundabout but <laughs> hopefully I, I made myself understood wonderful thank you so <clears throat> this is a very very deep question about the methods to detect analyze manifest direct that energy of the center that's really what the whole biogeometry trainings are about uh, I'll just give it a very quick, a uh, couple of quick points with that. One is that in ancient Egypt, you find that they use particular types of tools as antennas to be able to pick up these different energy qualities. We think of them today as things like pendulums and rods. The rods of the Egyptian priests had very specific powers to work with these different energy qualities and frequencies, both to detect and to project. And then the same thing with the pendulums. But the thing is that if you go to the 
archaeologists and say, well, show me the Egyptian pendulums. They don't talk about that. They label them all ritual objects. But all over Europe and elsewhere, they found all over the Valley of the Kings, these particular things that look exactly like a pendulum and are labeled ritual objects that at one point, huge numbers of people were using these in ancient Egypt. That's what was described by the French researchers in the 30s. That's what we talk about with uh, biogeometry today. Basically, it works as a type of free-hanging energy oscillator that when it couples sympathetically and sympathetic resonance with the energy quality it is meant to detect, the energy from that coupling will be read out as a rotational movement of that object. So what's referred to today as the Egyptian pendulum by the French, what they found in all these archaeological digs all over Egypt, these things, when you use them properly, you know how to activate them, you know how to tune them, then using the human energy field to activate them, they will show you when that energy is present or absent. We even have various types of energy me measurement rulers based on old Egyptian designs in biogeometry that allow us to detect then the intensity level of these different qualities, particularly the energy of the one, the energy that comes from the center. So that's the whole thing of what's called radiesthesia, the ability to detect these subtle energies, too subtle to be picked up by electromagnetic equipment. Now, the issue with this is that standard electromagnetic equipment cannot pick up these energies because it like detects like. And so something of a purely physical nature with some electromagnetic energy in it isn't resonating at that higher level of the divine energy, but a human being can. We have that in us. That little box doesn't. So the way that we can demonstrate an empirical effect from it, when modern science and technology doesn't want anything that involves human measurement, they only want machine measurement, is what you can do is you can create concentrations of this. And we have all kinds of techniques in biogeometry to be able to create and harmonize creations of this divine energy unified field force and bring it into homes, offices, the human body, etc. What you do is you do before and after biological testing on a human body. So before the person's exposed to these energies, or could be an animal or a plant, there's been a lot of this research done, you test what the biological markers show. What's the level of the stress markers in the body? What's the various markers in the blood and in the saliva and in various types of hormones in the body? Then you expose the body or the part of the body to strong concentrations of this using the biogeometry techniques. After you do that, you go back and you retest it with main mainstream medical markers and see the changes in the biological markers. That's the way to demonstrate it to modern science and medicine by showing, because it doesn't work abstractly, it works in living beings. So you have to see this through testing biological markers in living beings. So I'll leave it at that and go on to the next question. During a psychotropic experience, We'd love to know more about Robert's pendant. I'm guessing it's obsidian and how the shape helps. This question is also uh, to Andreas, if Andreas has any points. Andreas? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, from the point of view of uh, uh, QRI, kind of uh, valence and structuralism and, and, and things like that, anything that increases impedance matching will smooth out your experience. So like, you know, practicing loving kindness, practicing equanimity, anything that essentially allows the kiki or the spiky uh, shapes to essentially dissipate as opposed to aggregate or reinforce each other will essentially be protective. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of kind of like common, you know, Zendo, <laughs> Zendo wisdom of, you know, a very, uh, you know, cow a lot of, you know, like a, a very nice kind of like a pillows and couches and like you know mantras and essentially very very soft stimuli to kind of increase impedance matching reduce dissonance in general would be pretty good um and yeah practicing a lot of loving kindness i think that's a very very good recipe great thank you uh i know we have very little time so i'll just give a very brief answer to this what they did in ancient world is that they would focus on naturally occurring sacred power spots now, what we call a sacred power spot, whether it's Giza Plateau, Machu Picchu, people going to the Sedona Vortices, whatever it is, for their psychotropic experiences, is just like in the ancient world, you go there because, in a way, the definition of a sacred power spot is a place on the Earth's surface 
that is naturally concentrating that energy of the one, that energy of the divine plane, that unified field energy. That's what makes it a sacred power spot, because the earth has those points on it the same way that a human body has chakras and acupuncture points and meridians. It's the exact same principle. So a lot of this is to do it in a place that has the correct vibrational energy. You know, if you dose up on a bunch of LSD and go to the dark, smoky bar at midnight, where everybody's just projecting out the worst aspects of their id, you'll probably have a bad trip because your environment is not great. So that's like one of the most important things, the environment that you're in, both like the environment you're creating with music and friends and not having to deal with a bunch of crazy BS in the midst of your experience, like really basic stuff like that. Sacred Power Spot, if you can find it. And for people that have taken the biogeometry training, we teach them the methods to be able to create a sacred power spot energy in any location based on the ancient principles. The other part of it is getting yourself right. So you may not want to launch into a deep trip if you're in an extremely upset state. You want to get to some kind of level of, of balance. And a lot of this is, is having worked for a while on, there should, I think, be optimally some preparation before you do really heavy psychotropic trips of doing the basic self-help work of separating yourself from your thoughts and your emotions, observing them as if you're outside yourself and looking at another person, and with no reactivity, see what your actual destructive patterns of thought and emotion and actions really are. Once you can see that from the outside, like you're looking at another person and can separate yourself from it, it'll massively help you to get keep out of reactive mind when you're deep in the psychotropic state. Because deep psychotropic state is like learning to be a surfer. You want to do a dosage that's just enough that the wave of the psychotropic experience allows you to ride on the surface at incredible velocity to go wherever you want to go, but not so much that you're a novice surfer somewhere in Hawaii where there's an 80-foot wave about to crash on you and going to crush you on the rocks below, and you don't know which way is back up to breathe air and get back to the sun when you're that deep in the water. So it's all a question of being able to ride it. And a big part of that is people getting over control functions, getting stressed about it. That's when you start to spin out of control. You know, you got to ride the snake, right? Just like they talk about in ayahuasca things. You got to ride the snake. If you're not going to loosen up in that experience, it may go wrong. So that's a few things that I would point to in the beginning. Uh, very quick about, ask about the crystal I'm wearing. It's a, uh, actually, uh, a non-treated natural smoky quartz that's cut into a specific geometric pattern based on the work of Marcel Vogel, who's a person that created the magnetic coatings for hard drive systems that was the foundation of all modern computer technology. Marcel Vogel was an absolute genius with vibrational work and work with crystals. And uh, the smoky quartz has a particular effect of densifying the gene core life force in the human body. It helps to keep our energy coherent and to keep us strong. And I talk a lot more about what the actual energetic effects are from direct vibrational testing in the Vesica courses on vibrational powers of stones and minerals. And I know we're out of time now, so I want to thank you so much for the people at the Oxford Psychedelic Society. I want to thank you so much for uh, Andreas for joining us. Thank you for inviting me back, and I'll, I'll turn it back to, to Ali.